By the way, we were all giving you thumbs up as we went by, but you never looked. <laughs> Good evening. How's everybody doing? Awesome. Um, we are tonight continuing our study on the book of First Kings, and uh, we are in chapter, well, chapters 12, 13, and 14. This is session number seven. Our theme or our series for this is called Kingdom Come, and uh, tonight's lesson is called Kingdom Come Undone, okay, because this is the chapter, chapter 12, that the kingdom divides. It comes undone, doesn't it? It splits in two. And so it's a pretty remarkable chapter, as a matter of fact, on your outline, which did everybody get their outline? Did anybody get a handout yet? Y'all did? Somebody said no. Who said no? Y'all do have them? Are they three-hole punched? Isn't Aubrey special? I mean, she does a great job. She's got that done for me already. Well, I appreciate that. This is three pages tonight, by the way, so I'll have to kind of uh, sprout legs and really run with this one, okay? But you'll see in the introduction, one of the most rock-bottom moments of Israel's history happens right here tonight in this chapter as we read it. It, it doesn't happen tonight, but we're reading about it tonight. It happens right here in chapter 12 it is when the kingdom split in two when you do a timeline and I like timelines chronologies that will kind of plot out the 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 chronological order of events in scripture and I like I'm visual how many of you are like me you like to see charts and things like that interesting and I'll give this a little plug there is downtown in Blackwell America believe it or not a brand new uh, exhibit that's on display. It's where the uh, Holy Grounds coffee shop used to be. It's called the Creation Simulation Exhibit. I think I've got the wording right. It has been brought to Oklahoma from Minnesota. Uh, I've, I've gone through it. I've previewed it. I was asked to kind of take a look at it and I encourage you to go and, and look at it basically it's uh, artwork on the wall and some timelines that are really detailed and it takes you from creation to the time of Christ uh, there's not any real artifacts in there it's just this one lady's vision of having a, a, a way to learn the Bible in the way that she learned the Bible because she said she tried to read the Bible and it didn't make sense to her until she started trying to map it out and it's her way, and there's some artistic, artistic posters and things that'll tell you about different characters. But there's a timeline in there is what I'm trying to get at. And I mean, it's very detailed, a timeline that, that will take you through uh, Old and New Testaments. And in, in this area, when the kingdom divides, it's very prominent. I mean, every timeline I've ever seen does this. It, it starts off, well, for your view, it starts off with the creation on through, you know, Abraham and Noah and all that stuff. Noah's before Abraham. Anyway, you, you get all those things, and then you get your three kings. You got Saul, David, Solomon, and all of a sudden the timeline splits because you got to track some of the northern kingdom and you got to track the southern kingdom simultaneously. And, of course, the, the northern kingdom cuts off a little shorter than the southern kingdom goes a little further. And then, of course, there's some trickling back down to one timeline again during the restoration years. This is the moment this splits is in this chapter and it's dated and this is a date that I've read and have held fast to for, for many years. Uh, some variations to this date are just two or three years off but 930 BC, 930 BC is a pinnacle date. If you, if you ask a, a seasoned Christian or a minister or even sometimes a good Bible class teacher, hey, what happened in 930 B.C.? They're going to know that's the divided kingdom date. Uh, how many of you grew up learning 33 A.D. as an important date that was significant? 33 A.D. We now, we now tend to say 30 A.D. because we know we're off a little bit. But I grew up 33 A.D. I mean, uh, even some buildings, some churches of Christ, will have a cornerstone or some little inset in the masonry work 
or some kind of plaque that says such and such building built in 1926 church established in 33 AD how many of you have seen those and that's pretty cool that's pretty cool and if it's built before 1906 by the way sometimes it will say disciples of Christ instead of churches of Christ but it was a church of Christ and because that distinction didn't occur till 1906 and after the, at one time we were disciples of Christ and churches of Christ were simultaneously names that were used just a little FYI stuff okay uh, so this is an important chapter so let's go through the chapter summaries I've got a lot here in chapter 12 I got some in chapter 13 and some 14 so chapter 12 summary goes like this okay Solomon has died that's in the last chapter uh, his son Rehoboam uh, goes to Shechem to be made king okay Jeroboam who by the way had fled to Egypt because of that prophecy Ahijah had given him made Solomon upset and he was trying to kill Jeroboam so he goes and hides out of Egypt when Jeroboam finds out Solomon has died and now Rehoboam is in his place as king he returns and he makes a request of Rehoboam and the request was to lighten the load that had been placed on the people by Solomon and in return he promises loyalty to Rehoboam don't do like your father did this is one thing that you could say was a critique of Solomon's reign is that he taxed greatly the people putting great strain on them are you okay Karen you sure you're holding your chest okay Kevin check her out now okay take a breath breathe okay so uh, he says he goes to Rehoboam and says, uh, lighten the load, and Rehoboam says, give me three days and come back. Here's what Rehoboam does. He goes to the elders that served with his father Solomon, asking them for advice. And what was their advice? It's pretty good advice. Uh, you could be seen as the people's servant. That's the wording used there. You could be, you, it would do you well to be the servant to these people and grant them what they're requesting. Because it's not just Jeroboam going and making his request. It says Jeroboam and all of Israel went to Jeroboam, to, uh, Rehoboam, to make this request. Actually, these names confuse real easy, you know. But uh, the elders' advice was pretty, pretty good. In other words, they would admit Solomon had put heavy burden on on these people they saw it firsthand okay um, he rejects that advice and then he goes to his peers of his own age his his buddies playground buddies or whatever they are you know and he asked well what do you guys think and here is what they said we're gonna read this verses 10 and 11 and it's in verse 10 where they say these people have said to you your father put a heavy yoke on us but make our yoke lighter now tell them my little finger is thicker than my father's what waist my father laid on you a heavy yoke I will make it even heavier my father scourged you with whips I will scourge you with what now what do you think of that advice Here are these young men, same age as Rehoboam, saying, well, here's what we think you ought to say. What do you think of that? What do you pick up on Rehoboam's peers? <laughs> you know, my mom used to say, don't ever call anybody stupid. Who are you? <laughs> um, it's pretty... It's, a, it's, it, it's pretty arrogant, isn't it? Now, we could generalize here and say all young people are uh, stupid, <laughs> or we could say ignorant. Uh, and I know that's not true, that all people are, are, young people today are arrogant, but it's a fair assessment to say many young people today feel like they own the world and that they are the highest order of beings living among people. I mean, haven't even you and I, as, as old as we all are, 
Haven't we ever said of our parents that, oh, they're old fuddy duds, they don't know what they're talking about? And thought we knew better than mom or dad even? I mean, I did at least on a couple occasions, thought that dad was wrong and, you know, mom was always right, but <laughs> sometimes dad was wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, what does Jeroboam or Rehoboam think of that advice? Well, he likes it. <laughs> this, this, this is going in with a, with a good bluff hand. This is going in with a good... If you're going to start ruling, I mean, lay them rules down and make sure they hear you roar. Uh, you better do it in the beginning, right? It, I've always been told when you land a new job, always try to ask for everything you want at the beginning because you're not going to get it later. The best chance of getting anything is at the first part of it, okay? So... Here's kind of the technique and tactic, and this is exactly when Jeroboam comes back, this is what Rehoboam tells him. And when they hear this, when Jeroboam and the people hear this, um, it's quite remarkable um, what the response is. Look at verse 16 with me. When all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, what share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? To your tents, Israel. Look after your own house, David. So the Israelites went home. In other words, every man for themselves. You know, forget, forget the house of David now. This is all towards Judah, where Jerusalem is. Okay? By the way, I, I missed the part that this was all fulfilling... Uh, what God had ruled. Uh, this is uh, through the prophet Ahijah, that time when Jeroboam was on his way out of town, Ahijah was coming in, and he grabbed that cloak, took it off, tore it up in ten pieces, handed it to Jeroboam, and said, this is what the Lord said. There's going to be, you know, the ten pieces divided up. Okay. Uh, this is fulfilling that event. This was the Lord's doing, in other words. Okay, we go on and see only the Israelites living in Judah remained under Rehoboam's control. The rest of Israel rebelled. Rehoboam tried to squash the rebellion by sending out Adoniram, who was in charge of forced labor, but the Israelites did what with him? Killed him. Rehoboam managed to escape to Jerusalem in his chariot, and when he got home, the rest of Israel, but not the house of David, summoned Jeroboam and made him king over them, but Rehoboam tried to squash the rebellion by getting an army of 180,000 men. So he musters the army, but then there's this prophet named Shemaiah, or Shemaiah who uh, comes with this message from God, and this is verses 23 and 24. Say to Rehoboam, son of Solomon, king of Judah, to all Judah and Benjamin and to the rest of the people, this is what the Lord says. Do not go up to fight against your brothers, the Israelites. Go home, every one of you, for this is my doing. So they obeyed the word of the Lord and went home again as the Lord had ordered. So Jeroboam began to fortify places in the north like Shechem and Peniel in order to keep Israel from going to Jerusalem for sacrificing and from turning back to Rehoboam's influence. He built two golden calves, placing one at Bethel and one at Dan, one in the north and one in the south. Jeroboam also built shrines in the high places and appointed priests, even though they weren't Levites. He, they weren't godly priests to begin with anyway. He instituted festivals that would counter the festivals. I think it was on the 15th of the 10th month or something like that. I forget the verse reference. But it was encountering their festivals in Judah and began making offerings at the altar that he made. So in other words, he's setting up priests of his own willpower and of his own choice. He's building more shrines, more high places. He goes to the altar himself to make offerings. Okay? And uh, so there's, there's how he has planned to uh, reign over Israel. Chapter 13. While Jeroboam is at the altar making an offering, he's visited by a prophet. Now, I don't think this prophet had a name. Did y'all see a name or remember a name? As a matter of fact, this gets a little confusing because there's a prophet and then there's another guy referred to as an old prophet. Okay, But this prophet comes, and here are his words. 
13, verse 2. By the word of the Lord, he cried out against the altar. Altar, altar, this is what the Lord says. A son named Josiah will be born in the house of David. On you he will sacrifice the priest of the high places who make offerings here, and human bones will be burned on you. Now that's quite a prophecy. And I'll tell you why. Josiah doesn't come till 2 Kings many years later. But this is what happens. Josiah, remember, is the one that becomes king when he's eight years old. And it's during his reign that the book of the law was discovered, and they reinstituted it and followed all the things that were in there. That was Josiah's reign. This is the prophecy. Okay, he also declared that the altar would be split apart and ashes would be poured out of it. Jeroboam stretched out his hand toward the man saying, Seize him! And what happened to his hand? It shriveled up, and it says he couldn't bring it back in. It, it just shrivels up. Seize that man! I love that sound effect. I'll do it again. Is that coming through okay on the stream? I hope so. Got to use a little phlegm on that one. You have this seize him, seize him, and his hand goes withered. And then what was Jeroboam's um, reaction then? He's basically pleading to the prophet, please, please intercede to God on behalf and let him restore my hand, right? And it was. But the hand shrivels, the altar does split in two, the ashes are poured out. Okay, uh, Jeroboam asked the prophet to return home with him for a meal. This is after his hands were stored. Uh, but that prophet refused, and he said, and this is verses 8 and 9 of chapter 13, if you're following along, even if you were to give me half your possessions, I would not go with you, nor would I eat bread or drink water here. For I was commanded by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water or return by the way you came. So he took another road and did not return by the way he had come to Bethel. Now, there's this, uh, there's another old prophet that had heard about the other prophet, the first one, and what he had said to Jeroboam. And he goes and makes an attempt to have this prophet come to his house and eat with him at the old prophet's house but the prophet refuses saying the same thing he had said to Jeroboam I can't the Lord's given me the instructions to not eat or drink in this land okay but uh, he says the old prophet says well an angel has come to visit him and uh, says it's okay for you to come in and eat with me at my house but the text says he was lying okay but the first prophet didn't know that and so he agrees then to go ahead and go to this old prophet's house to eat with him now this gets a little strange uh, he's eating and drinking at the old prophet's house and then the word of the Lord came to the old prophet, but it's speaking to the prophet. Now that, that was kind of weird how that was worded there. But he says, the word of the Lord says, and this is uh, chapter 13, verses 21 and 22. This is what the Lord says. You have defied the word of the Lord and have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. You came back and ate bread and drank water in the place where he told you not to eat or drink. Therefore, your body will not be buried in the tomb of your ancestors. When the man of God had finished eating and drinking, the prophet who had brought him back saddled his donkey for him. Okay, he goes on his way. And then uh, um, he's attacked by what? A lion. And it's interesting. Because he doesn't maul or eat the man's body, but it's lying there in the road, and the lion lays down, and the donkey the guy was riding is lying down by the lion. Now, if I'd been the donkey, I think I would have got out of the high, tilled it out of there. But here both of them are, and word had gotten back to the old prophet, the house that he just left, and he goes and sees what he sees. 
that there's the lion, there's the donkey, he's able to get the body, he gives instructions, have this guy buried in my tomb, and uh, he gave these instructions, this is verses 31 and 32. When I die, bury me in the grave where the man of God is buried, lay my bones beside his bones. For the message he declared by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the shrines on the high places in the towns of Samaria will certainly come true. And then it says of the rest of the chapter that Jeroboam continued to do evil and appointed even more priests at the high places. And thus we have this conclusion, verse 34. This was the sin of the house of Jeroboam that led to its downfall and to its destruction from the face of the earth. And now chapter 14 summary. And I've divided this up into two parts. There's a part about Jeroboam's reign and a part about Rehoboam's reign. The part about Jeroboam's reign. He has a son named Abijah who's ill. So Jeroboam decides, I'm going to send my wife in disguise along with ten loaves of bread and some cakes and along with a jar of honey. And in an attempt to find out what becomes of the boy, go and visit the prophet Ahijah about my boy. Now Ahijah at this point is not able to see, but God had given him a message that Jeroboam sent in his wife in disguise. He gave Ahijah all the heads up here, but here's what's going on. And she comes in under this disguise with these gifts, but he begins to say, and this is verse 6, Come in, wife of Jeroboam, why this pretense? I have sent to you I have been sent to you with bad news. Go tell Jeroboam that this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Now, this is interesting. She has come to him thinking she's in disguise in stealth mode. And he says, hello, wife of Jeroboam. The Lord has sent me to you. But she's come to him. But the Lord has positioned me to send. I've been sent to you with this message. And here's the message. I raised you up from among the people and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you. But you've not been like my servant David who kept my commands and followed me with all his heart, doing only what was right in my eyes. You've done more evil than all who lived before you. You have made for yourself other gods, idols made of metal. You have aroused my anger and turned your back on me. Do you remember, by the way, I'm going to push pause on this. When we are given the, the Ten Commandments, the first one's given an explanation along with it. You shall have no other gods before me. Why? For I am a what kind of God? Jealous God. For I am a jealous God. Verse 10, because of this, I'm going to bring disaster on the house of Jeroboam. I will cut off from Jeroboam every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will burn up the house of Jeroboam as one d uh, burns dung until it is all gone. Dogs will eat those belonging to Jeroboam who die in the city, and the birds will feed on those who die in the country. The Lord has spoken. As for you, go back home. When you set foot in your city, the boy will what? All Israel will mourn for him and bury him. He's the only one belonging to Jeroboam who he buried because he's the only one in the house of Jeroboam in whom the Lord, the God of Israel, has found anything good. The Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel who cut off the family of Jeroboam, even though this is beginning to happen, and the Lord will strike Israel so that it will be like a reed swaying in the water. He will uproot Israel from this good land that he gave to their ancestors and, scatters, and scatter from beyond the Euphrates River because they aroused the Lord's anger by making Asherah poles, and he will give Israel up because of the sins Jeroboam has committed and has caused Israel to commit. Okay. So Jeroboam's wife returns home the moment she steps over the threshold of the house, the boy dies. And Jeroboam continued to do evil and appointed even more priests at the high places. And thus we have this, uh, sorry, I am in the wrong deal. I, I, I jumped on my notes, sorry. He, he reigns 22 years, sorry about that. Jeroboam reigns 22 years. 
after he died it says his son Nadab succeeded him so I can assume I guess that Nadab is a son that's born after this time frame um, of, of, of you would have no uh, remaining son right now reign on the throne uh, the next part of the chapter is about Rehoboam Rehoboam's 41 and he began his reign he reigns for 17 years and a summation of how Judah was doing during Rehoboam's reign is given in verses 22 through 24 let's read that together Judah did evil in the eyes of the Lord by the sins they committed they stirred up his jealous anger more than those who were before them had done they also set up for themselves high places sacred stones and asherah poles on every high hill in every spreading tree there were even male shrine prostitutes in the land and the people engaged in all the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites in Rehoboam's fifth year as king Shishak king of Egypt had attacked Jerusalem and carried off every bit of that gold from the treasury of the temple and the royal palace including the gold shields that you remember Solomon had made Rehoboam decides to replace those with bronze shields and had his men as guards whenever he goes to the temple there to use them but then when he's not going to the temple there to store them back in storage it says there's continual warfare between Rehoboam and Jeroboam those years for as long as he was alive when he died his son Abijah succeeded him I find it interesting, I'll just say this from the outset as we have now kind of skimmed those chapters, that there, there was an opportunity for at least one of those kingdoms to have done good. But both of those kingdoms are doing the exact same thing, aren't they? And, and you would have thought that, okay, well, at least these guys would have recognized that I need to be different from my enemy but they are the same all they were interested seems like is who could gain the power maintaining control of the majority of Israel uh, Jeroboam makes the attempt to make sure he doesn't lose any of the ten tribes to Judah to Rehoboam and he does what I really feel like is a smart move from a secular point of view of building the shrines the way he does to set it up so that you don't have to go to Jerusalem it's okay for you to stay here but why on earth would he make it feel like you don't have to go to Jerusalem to worship when he's also building other shrines and other idols made of metal saying these are now what you can go worship you know he's not only offering a place to go uh, he's offering options to who for whom to worship so it's not just changing where you worship, it's changing who you worship. And Rehoboam would have done well, even from a secular point of view, if he had stayed true to just the worshiping of God and not messed with those idols. But it's almost like, oh, you're going to build shrines? Let me show you what I can do. I can do shrines over here on my high places. To the same gods. Both of them were building stuff to Ashra. I find that kind of ridiculous. And they should have known that for uh, they would have known what was happening in the north they would have had reconnaissance and reports and they would have known what the other was, others were doing I just find that strange uh, let's let's just pause here for a moment I've I've been doing all the talking let's let you guys do some talking what do you find in these three chapters what's what's interesting to you guys what kind of what kind of caught your attention Hmm? Yeah, I mean, neither one. Jeroboam, he doesn't learn. Rehoboam, he doesn't learn either. You would have thought that the shriveled hand incident would have been a wake up call. And he does seem to, when it happens, he doesn't waste any time going to that man of God saying, hey, can you intercede for me on, for, to God? this needs fixed and then kind of as a nice gesture after it's fixed come to my house eat a meal with me 
a show of appreciation, I would think. But then he goes and does more and appoints more priests for his own causes. Rehoboam, uh, he had an opportunity to do a smart thing. And, but he allows his friends, the peer pressure, to influence him more than the wisdom of the elders. Now, I'm not, I'm not here to belittle or degrade young people. As a matter of fact, Paul would tell Timothy these instructions, don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. And he says to Timothy, you can be an example to the rest of believers. In other words, the implication is, we can learn a thing or two from our young people. Wouldn't you agree with that? We can learn from our young people. But I also know this. It's wise to be around the people who are wise. And guess where wisdom comes from? Experience, which young people don't have. Go ahead. That's a, that's, a, that's a good point, a very good point, because, you know, uh, there, there, there's, an, there's a saying, it's who you know, maybe not what you know, that, that kind of rings true here. Because you can have person A that, you know, when he dies off, person B comes and replaces person A and does the exact same thing that person A did without the same result because person B doesn't have the connections and person A did were you fixing to say something John? okay so I believe it is who you know in 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 can you get away with taxing people and giving a a, a, a heavy burden on the people yeah if you have kind of worked your way up to that and earned their respect I mean how many of you and this is just a personal question how many of you don't mind paying a little bit of a higher price for a better steak at a restaurant? You know what I mean? And, of course, there's some of us, oh, I wouldn't pay more than 10 bucks for a steak. I don't see why you'd pay 40 bucks for a steak. Well, you need to try some steaks I've tried, okay? <laughs> I'm hungry. Uh, you, you, you're willing to pay the higher price, even though you know this is an ex exaggerated price this is this is uh, how would I call it uh, this, you know for those of us that might be frugal it it might be hard to do that you know what I mean it might be hard to explain that but some people are willing to do that if it's good and part of the experience is the atmosphere and the, the sides and I mean you know that just goes along with it somebody had a hand up Yeah, and now you don't have any gold. All that gold is gone. All of it. All that we were counting on and having an inventory of. I think that's why there was so much detail in the previous chapters to give us an enumerated list of how many talents of this and how many talents came from that. Gone. All of it. Now you've got no splendor in the temple. Not that the gold should have been the splendor anyway, but people, people will look at that and say, wow, I mean, the Queen of Sheba, wow. Everybody else, wow. The neighboring, the neighboring countries, wow. Because it all painted this pretty picture that gave a reputable uh, um, rapport to Solomon. Even though his own elders would have admitted to Rehoboam, it was a hard burden on these people. Um, I've been to the Taj Mahal in Agra. Uh, it's a great place to visit when you're on the grounds. Beautiful architecture. Interesting things about the engineering uh, feat that was accomplished there. For example, every one of those towers, the four towers that are around 
the Taj Mahal lean outward away from the shrine itself in case of earthquake or other wind or whatever it would not fall on the structure but fall away designed that way uh, when you look at the artwork and the mosaic patterns of these pieces of marbling and quartz that are embedded the mogul community was under forced labor to build this shrine it was hard labor but, but what even if you were enslaved to build that you'd still look back at that and say look at that that'd be splendor for you even though you were forced to do that now everything else around that wouldn't look like a very royal place to be um, it's it's interesting the conditions on the outside of the wall and the inside of the wall different as night and day different as night and day those the mogul communities around it are, are impoverished but what a magnificent jewel uh, there um, I kind of feel like that was a part of the aura of Jerusalem that people could have a sense of pride in but when things start going like this and they begin to fall apart uh, it's it starts that glory that pride the morale we've been talking about the morale of the people it's like the wind is let out and it is degrading and demoralizing and this is happening let's look through uh, questions to ponder why did Jeroboam try to cooperate with Rehoboam remember he when he comes back from Egypt he goes to Rehoboam and says hey if you lighten the load we'll be loyal to you he's trying to make an effort isn't he it seems like to me he's making an effort mm -hmm. he probably wants to see the kingdom to do well to have that splendor going you know it is true not until Solomon threatens to kill him he's probably loyal to Solomon okay why would Rehoboam listen to the younger men and not the older? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is their chance to shine. And I even think this way sometimes. Uh, I think maybe to, you know, in, in the business world, for example, in the business world, I, I, I want to use John as an example of this because he's in business for building. But, but you've got a, you have a unique approach uh, in how you, you uh, present your, step, your stuff at your building. You're not just showing hey this is the drywall job that we did for such and such house and the shingles we put on that roof and you know this is the front door we put into the Smith's home across the street you are unique in the fact that you are creating these pergolas and outdoor kitchens and things that are unique you are finding a way you know how to market you know what I mean because I'm, I'm seeing this on your Facebook and I'm thinking this is the stuff that gets my wife to thinking about things, you know. <laughs> it's working. <laughs> and when you go, ha when you have a product, whether it's a service like you have, or if you have a product to sell, what's the one thing uh, the Shark Tank people are going to tell you you need? You need what makes your product or service stand out from all the rest? What? these young people are probably thinking are you need to make a statement for yourself and you need to stand out don't just keep doing the things like your dad did do it even more make it stand out now it, the truth of the matter is he had a chance to be different by going the other way but I suspect that it's easier to turn down the people you're not connected to as well as the ones that you are connected to these were the elders of his dad but they weren't his elders but his peers these are the ones he probably to put it in modern day colloquial context 
these are the ones that he had passed the football to in that game that beat the, you know, made them district champs. These are the guys that, that, that made the free throw shots at the last few seconds. These are the, these are the buddies, the homeboys, okay? These are who I hang with. And it's hard to, uh, to cut those ties relationally. Anybody else have an answer on that one? Or? Oh, yeah. Uh, that probably, you know, I think that he probably saw that serve. I don't want to serve them. But the people, the elders are saying, this could actually be a, a good move for you as king, to be seen as the people's king, you know. How did Jesus come as a servant? I didn't come to be served, but to serve. Okay. Uh, how do you think Rehoboam felt after he musters an army of 180,000 men only to have them turn away after this prophet came through and told him what the Lord said? Well, there goes that plan. <laughs> and, from, and there's going to be continued battle and war between the two. How would you have Jeroboam's fortifications and competing strategies in other words building the alternate places to go and sacrifice as well as setting on the calendar festivals that coincided with their festival dates to keep them from going to Jerusalem now it says how do you evaluate that from a secular point of view and then it says how about a spiritual point of view hmm yeah, the, the, the priests are not Levites, that's true. I think from a secular point of view, it's brilliant. This is a brilliant strategy. If what you're trying to do is to keep them from going back to the former way, and you're trying to start a new regime or whatever, that was smart. From a spiritual point of view, it stunk because you're leaving behind the main power and protector of the one, by the way, that ordained you to have this opportunity and was given the same promise that Solomon was, if you follow my instructions, I'm going to bless you. It's biting the hand that feeds you, isn't it? Why do you think God granted Jeroboam's hand to be restored? If you were God, would you have done that? I'm thinking I would have left it withered. <laughs> I mean, after all, I'm jealous. And what you're doing is not right. You're sacrificing to another God right now. I'm going to keep that hand shriveled. God's got more mercy and grace than I do. That should be a final point, I guess. After Jeroboam's hand shriveled and then was restored, this is on page 19, why would he continue to assign more priests and build more shrines? seems to me like didn't God just prove a point who's in charge here and uh, go ahead with the Moses dialogue yeah uh, it, 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 yeah even though it doesn't state it as such because this is the Lord's doing this tearing the kingdom away and all this he could have been hardening and softening the heart just like he did with Pharaoh we're just not told that specifically I think, it's, uh, I think it's kind of uh, funny and sad at the same time. That here you are making an offering on an altar to your new God, but you have to go back to the God of Israel to ask for a hand to be restored. you got to talk to that prophet that just gave you the bad news. And after you had said, seize him. I love doing that. I'm getting better at it. And why wouldn't he have turned to his own altar, to his own gods that he's built, and, it's, and say, fix this? And then to show appreciation afterwards to the prophet. Why does he then continue to keep doing the same thing? Why do we as people keep making the same mistakes over and over? And we're told why this won't work this way but we just keep if you keep doing the same thing the same way you're going to keep getting the same result why does he think it will change I'm not asking that presuming that we have an answer to that question I'm just asking that because I think in a way 
we all could be like that to a degree I mean have you ever touched the bench that said wet paint come on Kevin have you stove's hot have you ever touched the stove when somebody said stove's hot and then my you have okay has anybody ever done it twice of course <laughs> you know uh, what was that word mom used a while ago stupid that was the word <laughs> wasn't it I'm quoting by the way you do it once it's a mistake if you keep doing it that's ignorance don't you agree you're not picking up on some wisdom here why do you think God didn't want that prophet to eat or drink in that land it, it, it's, it, it's probably a show of well, kind of like the Hebrew children that are taken off to Babylon not eating the meat from the king's table uh, pr probably because it's meat sacrificed to idols for one but give us vegetables only and see how we do and of course they pass that test and, but they're not going to defile themselves and bother their own conscience and this is a way of God saying I don't want any indication that I have a part or endorse what you're doing in this land right now why or what was the motivation for the old prophet to lie to the other prophet about coming and eating in his house and he had been visited by an angel what's up with that what motivation did he have this doesn't make sense does it oh well an angel visited me and said it's okay for you to come and then he's convinced that God's whatever God had prophesied through this guy is going to come true I just again these are questions to ponder not questions to that we're going to actually answer but questions to ponder do you think God's punishment for the prophet was too harsh I mean I, I know I get it we're really uneasy about questioning God for what he do, does aren't we but it is something to ponder I mean come on the, the guy was only taking the old prophet's word that oh well if God spoke to you then it must be okay then is there a lesson in that for us <laughs> well that's right but how do I know he goes against God's will to begin with maybe the better way to say that is never assume what you hear is the truth no matter who it comes from you know what does uh, John write in 1 John 4 verse 1 don't believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether or not they come from God we need to be discern discerning in what we listen and what we ingest uh, why would Jeroboam have his wife disguised when he sent her to go to Ahijah it's a good question and that might be that might lead to a good answer this was chapter 14. Shiloh. Okay. Now, where's Shiloh? I don't have the Bible that has a map in it, but I'm not sure where Shiloh is. Why do you think God would allow Jeroboam's boy to die well it doesn't say you know that God caused the boy's illness um, but God doesn't intervene and God because he's sovereign has the prerogative to not intervene we all know this we have prayed many times for people and God has a better reason than we can ever fathom 
and it irritates us to no end but it's the sovereignty of God and the fact that God has a better view of uh, the big picture than we do even though we try to get a big view of the big picture and can't so I don't think there's a reason for the disguise because of that anyway so we don't know we just don't know okay discussion you would have thought that a shriveling of a hand incident would have been a wake-up call for Jeroboam I made that point a while ago what are some wake-up calls that occur to us today what what could be hey that's a wake-up call and it's not like uh, Oh, some of you guys were at the men's prayer breakfast and you heard Troy Woolery talk about when he was feeling led into the ministry and he said, I know we don't use the word or the terminology in the church that I was called to the ministry, but I felt like I was called, not that I heard God speak, but there were things that were compelling me. What are some things that might have compelled us or compelled you to think, hey, this might be a wake-up call from God? Have you ever had those? Some people refer to him as a holy nudge. <laughs> A gut in your uh, a feeling in your gut something that's compelling you to do something what what would be an example of that when you get a wake-up call could an automobile accident be a wake-up call you know not that maybe hey what's Denny done to deserve that or I wonder what he's trying to tell God but it it does remind you of life is short right that it's a wake-up call to me can a prognosis that's bad be a wake-up call? Yeah. What else could be a wake-up call? Yeah, it's almost like, how did you know I was thinking about that? Uh, it's, it's almost as if, could you read my mind? Could you, what premonition do you have, you know? Um, this, um, you know, I've told stories about things that I think there's been wake-up calls. Hindsight's 2020. We all know that. We, I believe in the providence of God. I just can't predict it. <laughs> and I don't know who can. But I believe in it. I think God opens doors, and I think God closes doors. Y'all believe that? I tr I've tried closing some doors God's opened. And I thought I closed it, and he opens it again. And I thought I closed it, and he opens it again. And a third time, I try to close it. And he, it's like he put the foot in the door to keep me from closing it. That was kind of a, here's your sign. <laughs> you know, here's your sign. Um, why, why do we not pay attention to wake-up calls? I know nobody here probably has the shriveled hand incident, but spiritual stupidity, okay? We're going to put a modifier to that word. Go ahead. Oh. I wasn't even thinking about this. I hope I was not offending you. Um, yes. Uh, sorry. Are you crying? You're laughing. Okay. Let's go into that because it was a day she had a terrible accident. I was there that day. Well, I wasn't there at the scene, but I saw the scene, and she's lucky to be alive. And I don't even want to say lucky. She's blessed to be alive. God took care of her, and I'm glad, um, and I don't know what to say about the shrivel hand, but it's, <laughs> uh, uh, go to Jesus, <laughs> do what, yeah, yeah, how many surgeries did you have, oh, yeah, on, eight surgeries on the hand alone, but, uh, you know, and it's it's just a way to wake you up, and uh, I mean, it's used to to remind us how short life is. She had kids in the car with her. Uh, it it's just makes you appreciate what you have. Am I over time? Huh? It woke a lot of people up. That's right. Um. How important is it that we make sure instructions come from God and not man? This is going back to the prophet trusting what the old prophet had said to him about having a visit from the angel. Let me give you an example of one. 
well mom said that God doesn't require you fill in the blank and of course that was mom so I trust mom do you know that most religious error happens because we take for granted what others have said to us think about that religious error happens because most of us take for granted what others have said to us and many times others are a relative if it was good enough for grandma or grandpa it's good enough for me or mom never believed that or dad always did this well they don't get you to heaven do they they can facilitate the path but no one gets to heaven on the coattails of mom and dad or grandparents Paul told Timothy he was thankful that he for his sincere faith it was his faith now at first dwelt in grandmother and mother Eunice and Lois but it was his he owned it he had a hand up oh yeah In chapter 14, God speaks through Ahijah to indicate why he was so upset with Jeroboam. If God were to send someone like Ahijah to us today, what would he say of us? You know, what he said to Jeroboam was, I put you in this place. I gave you this opportunity. I'm paraphrasing. I gave you the promise I'd bless you. You've gone and built shrines for yourselves. You've turned your back on me. You're leading other people astray you're fighting and with your brother what would he say of us today kind of indicts us when we really think about it you know um, have you ever said something rash and hasty out of anger not knowing that maybe uh, member of the church where you go or where you attend was standing right behind you in the line oh hi I got a funny story about this lady went into a grocery store went to the back to the produce section she sees a guy working that produce she says I'd like to buy a half a head of lettuce and he says well ma'am we only sell whole heads of lettuce so I don't need a whole head I can't eat it all by myself it goes bad before I can eat it I'm just by myself I just need a half a head of lettuce he says, ma'am, I, I know that, but it's cheap enough. I mean, if you can give it to somebody, we only sell whole heads. We don't sell half a head of lettuce. And she became a little bit irate and says, I, wanna, I want a half a head of lettuce. I'd like to see the store manager. And he says, I'll go and get one for you. So he goes up to the front and finds a store manager. And he says, there is this one crazy belligerent lady back there that wants to buy a half a head of lettuce. And then she taps him on the shoulder. And he says, and this nice lady would like to buy the other half. <laughs> I suckered you into that one. What can we learn from both Jeroboam and Rehoboam's reign? I kind of started off with this because uh, they're all doing the same thing, you know. They're both doing the same thing. Come on in. <clears throat> That's being streamed all over. <laughs> I didn't see anything. Uh, here's our things to consider, some final points. It's good to make efforts that lead to peace. I think Jeroboam tries. What his intentions were, I don't know, but he at least tries. Hey, would you lighten up on us, and we'd be loyal to you. We should listen to God's expectations and remember his warnings. Not everything we hear is true, even though it might seem to be. If you have any final thoughts, any other points that are bottom line points here, I can't think of anything else so I, I guess with that we're going to go ahead and close this session next session we are I think in a couple of chapters I think it's 15 and 16 and it should be on your outline thanks for joining us for the study I hope to see you Sunday by the way uh, a little preview uh, I'm starting a new series just for the month of August four-part series called the overcomers 
uh, living with victory in view. And what it is, it's about four different people from the scripture that had some things, some difficulties to overcome, starting with Jeremiah, Job, Paul, and Jesus. These are the overcomers I'm going to deal with. Jeremiah, the lesson's called Life at the Bottom. So hope to see you Sunday morning. We'll see you later.